Okay. Thanks to everybody for logging in today for our April PLC. And we're really, really pleased to have Courtney Tabor Abbott with us today. And she's a transition specialist rehab counselor. And she's going to be focusing on concept development for living skills with an emphasis on the development of essential skills that are important for a successful transition process. And this is the perfect time of year for us to have a presentation like this, Courtney, because we're all starting to look at transition planning for many of our students. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to let you take over. Um, Courtney is, or you were, a transition coach at Perkins. Yes. And I don't know if you want to um, introduce yourself in terms of where, where you're presently working, or maybe you're just being a mom. <laughs> Courtney, take it over. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I'm Courtney Tabor Abbott, um, and I can just give you guys a little bit of a background on who I am to start. Um, I have um, I graduated from Middlebury College, um, and I have a um, master's in social work from University of New England, um, and. Um, after that, I became a vocational rehab counselor at the Maine Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Um, I did that for a few years and then went to Perkins School for the Blind where I was a transition specialist for a few years. And so I, I did a lot of um, transition work and consulting with students um, who were in high school um, all around the state of Massachusetts. Um, I recently moved back up to Maine, um, and I love it up here. Um, and where I am now, I do several different things. I, um, I am a mom, yes, of two little boys, um, but I also um, work at the IRIS Network, which is Maine's nonprofit for um, individuals with vision impairments, and um, I'm a vocational development counselor there. Um, and I also do some web content writing for Perkins. Um, I still write for Perkins through their Path to Transition blog. Um, so I write some blog posts um, for parents and teachers, helping them prepare students um, for their transitions out of high school. Um, and I also do some private um, transition services co um, consulting work with, um, with some students. So I do kind of a bunch of different things. <laughs> um, that keeps me quite busy. Um, so, um, so today I wanted to talk a little bit about something that I'm actually pretty passionate about, um, concept development. Um, oh, actually, I want to just tell you also, I um, am coming from this um, with, uh, with the perspective of, of someone who's taught with students with vision impairments, but I also have a vision impairment. Um, I, have, I was being born with Lieber's congenital amaurosis, so I... Um, I have only light perception in one eye at this point, so um, I am doing this presentation using a, actually I have a Mac in front of me as well as a PC with JAWS on it, so I'm doing a couple different things as we talk. So, um, so feel free to ask me questions throughout, and I will also give time for questions at the end, hopefully we'll have time. Um, so I want to start with the, um, oh, um, Ross, you can move to the slide, the next slide. Sorry, I'm not giving you good feedback on that. Um, so what no is- No problem, I've, I've been guessing and I think I'm okay. caught up. Awesome, thank you. Um, so let's just start with, with what is transition planning. So transition planning is really designed to help students um, with a disability transition to, to a young adulthood. Um, and that can be anything from independent living to college, to work. Um, or some combination of those things. It could be, you know, planning for a person to enter, um, you know, um, a residential program. It really can be anything that meets that student's needs. Um, and the point is transition planning is that it's individualized and it really has to, you know, specifically meet that student's needs. Um, and um, ideally, transition planning is a team approach and, you know, really involves the parents, the teachers, and and anyone else that's really involved in that student's education. Um, so um, moving on to when should transition services begin. Um, 
although I did some research, I, I had a little trouble finding, um, is there a law regarding how when transition service should, should start in Canada? Because there is one here in the US, but I wasn't sure if there's an age that is required for students where you guys are. There is not one, Courtney, it's Roy here. Okay, okay, um, okay. good to know. So um, <clears throat> in the US, um, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act requires that transition services start at age 16 for all students with disabilities. Um, but a lot of schools and, um, start earlier, and actually several states mandate that they start at age 14, um, especially with students with vision impairments, that seems to be the, more of the norm. Um, just because, as you probably all know, transition services for, vision, uh, for students with vision impairments is pretty complex, just making that plan. Um, although, my point here is really that even though there's, you know, there may or may not be requirements for when you're supposed to start, I really think that transition planning starts really, really early. Um, like that anything we're doing with, with children with vision impairments, even at, you know, um, ages three, four, five are, you know, that's preparing for transition. So, you know, we're teaching a child to tie her shoes. That's, that's helping her with independent living skills. We're teaching, um, you know, we're teaching a couple little kids to play a game. Um, that's teaching them turn taking, which is a social skill, which is really important for adult life. So um, anything really can be transition planning, as long as it's gonna help the student become, you know, um, a more competent and, and confident adult. Um, so, um, so moving on to concept development, which is kind of the main focus of our, um, our talk today. Um, so a lot of times in education, we really focus on skill development. We talk a lot about how is the student gonna build this skill? How are they gonna learn Braille? Or how are they going to learn how to, um, you know, use this piece of technology or, or you know, learn the curriculum? Um, and we think about those little details of everyday life of how the student's just gonna get through the day. And we also think about those big questions like, well, what are they gonna do for the rest of their life? Um, and we often get caught up in those things, I think. Um, and when we get caught up in those, I mean, those are all important, but we tend to forget about the fact that there's a lot of concepts behind those skills. And it's really essential that um, students build those concepts in order to really build the skills um, that go along with those. Um, so just as a very basic um, explanation, you know, so you can't learn to tie your shoe unless you understand what a shoe is, right? So that's a pretty basic example, but um, you know we can kind of take that as our, you know, um, as our idea moving forward. Um, and and concept development really helps students to build the skills they need, but it also just helps them to have a, a general awareness of the world around them. So students with vision impairments, as they build concepts of you know what this object is or what this activity is. They're, they're becoming more able to interact with the world around them. Um, so, um, okay. So concept development versus skill development. Um, so a concept is a mental representation of something that's either tangible um, or something that's intangible. So tangible and concrete things, that's basic stuff like a tree, an apple, a dog, um, you know, understanding what those things are um, and something that's intangible and that's referring to things like emotions um, like the color purple or you know feeling happy or that something is easy or difficult those are all kind of intangible concepts or intangible ideas so um, and a skill is really the ability to perform the task so we need the concepts behind those things in order to build on the skills um, um, there's a few different kinds of concepts, right? So we have the concrete concepts like things that you can touch, right? Like a bus or um, grass or a shoe. Um, then there are things that are, you know, less concrete, things that you can observe, but you can't actually physically touch. So things like um, jump or run, um, um, or even like directional words like behind or over, um, or, you know, soft or purple. Um, I think I said purple earlier. I guess I really like purple, but <laughs> um, so 
you know, uh, those are kinds of the things that are a little bit less concrete, um, but still able to kind of be be observed in, in some way in the environment. Um, and the last kind of concept is the abstract concepts. And those are the, you know, more intangible things, like I mentioned earlier, the feelings um, or ideas. So maybe like love or difficult or understand um, or, you know, sad. So um, that's just to kind of give an overview of, of what concepts are and as we move forward um, so that we kind of all are on the same page about what we're discussing next for concept development. Um, slide nine, slide eight, concept development. Okay, kind of so slide seven, types of concepts. what I want to talk about now is why concept development is important. So first, let's think about concept development in a sighted individual. Um, so I want to kind of give an example here. Um, if you think about, let's say, um, let's say you are talking to someone about a hockey. Um, it's a sport. Most people, even if they don't watch hockey, have a concept of what hockey is, right? Like they might understand, you know, because they've seen it on television or they've been to a game or someone's talked about it or they've seen a hockey stick. So even if you're not, you know, someone who plays the game, you can kind of understand it. And even if you've never really seen it before, a person who is sighted could kind of go into, um, could go to a hockey game and kind of walk in and get a sense of what's happening, right? So you might not totally understand every rule of the game, but you can, you can sit down and you can watch and you can see that there's um, an ice rink and that there's lines on the ice, I think. <laughs> and that there's, you know, there's the hockey stick and the puck and all the players. Um, and so you're really, as a sighted individual, a person is really picking up all of that information with their vision and with their other senses too. It's not to kind of say that they're not using those, but, but vision is, it tends to be the most used sense by someone with, um, with full vision. Um, and they're also able to incorporate those concepts into, their, into the schemas that they already have. So, um, so you know, if you've, let's say you go into a restaurant as, as another example um you've never been to this restaurant before but you can look at the inside of the restaurant when you walk in you can say oh this is just like the other restaurant that i was at last week you know it, it has tables and chairs and you can really easily process that concept into the schemas that you already have um so that's kind of what it's like for someone with vision um now, for someone without vision, um, it's a little bit different. So, a, a person with a vision impairment still picks up concepts through their senses, right? Um, and, and that can be, you know, their hearing, their sense of touch. It can also be through any residual vision that they do have. Um, I, I will say that I think sometimes that vision is reliable. Um, sometimes it's not, though. Sometimes, so for me, as I lost vision over the course of my life, I um, I often felt that my, like, I, I thought I understood what I was seeing and didn't necessarily, you know, because I was trying to fit it into what I remembered um, visually. So sometimes the concepts you pick up through residual vision are, are reliable, and sometimes they're, you know, they're not full because you can't get a full picture of what's actually going on. Um, so just um, let's bring up the restaurant example again. So. Um, let's say a student has only a child who's young has only ever been to one kind of restaurant. Um, do you guys have like an Olive Garden? Do they have that in Canada? <laughs> yes, do we like, do. All right. Okay. I was trying to think of something that might be all over the place. So, um, um, part of my ignorance there. Um, but so let's say a child's only been to an Olive Garden, right? They, they know what it's like. They've been there, they've gone in, they sit at the table, they, they know someone comes and takes their order. And at the end, you know, somebody pays for the meal and they leave. Um, and then, you know, one day they go to um, somewhere more like a Chipotle. Do you guys have Chipotle? Um, Not sure about that one. Okay, all right. Have, Chipotle. have to help me on that one. <laughs> okay, so let's say we go to a restaurant where there's. Um, a different style. Instead of going and sitting down, you actually go up to the counter and you have to walk along the counter to order your food. Um, 
it's also like a like a subway type of style so you walk up you say whether you want you know this kind of bread and then you say what you want on your bread and then you walk down and you have to tell the the person making your food um what kind of vegetables you want and so and the students never been to a place like that so for a sighted person you can walk in and, and even if you've never been there you can easily understand okay I'm not actually going to sit down and give my order to to someone. Um, I'm actually going to order it right here at the counter and I'm going to get my food and, and pay for it. And then I'm going to sit down or I'm going to take it out with me. Um, but if a person with a vision impairment is, is likely going to be pretty overwhelmed with that unless someone's explained it to them in advance or, or is explaining it to them when they come in. Right. So they're going to walk in and it's probably going to be louder than another kind of restaurant where they where it's sit down because people are yelling out their orders and it's going to be you know, um, probably a little bit stressful and, and confusing. Um, the first time I ever went to a restaurant like that, I was just, uh, I was totally confused and it took me a while to figure it out. Um, now, once someone has been exposed to that and once someone's been explained, you know, once it's been explained what that is, it's, it's a lot less confusing, but, but there is some intentional teaching that's involved in helping that, that person to understand the concept of that kind of restaurant, right? So, um, and a lot of students don't, um, a lot of students with vision impairments miss out on, the, on concept development because of a couple things, right? So one is that they just don't have the visual observation that a sighted person might have. The other is that they're a little, you know, oftentimes they're just not exposed to the same experiences, right? So, so, um, Sometimes um, you might experience that parents tend to maybe shelter a child a little bit um, and they, you know, they might not, maybe a child gets invited to a pool party and the parent feels a little nervous or doesn't send them, for example. So they're missing out on like on the experience and understanding what is a pool party or what is, what does it mean when, you know, what is this game that my friends are playing? I don't understand it. Um, or it's even less intentional, right? Maybe it's something like, for me, when I was growing up, my, my parents, my mom always was the one who cooked and she never wanted anyone else to help her in the kitchen. That was kind of her like, leave me alone time, I'm making dinner. Um, and that's fine, except the problem was that because I couldn't see her cooking and, and she didn't really want help, I never really learned how to cook. I couldn't really watch her. Um, and so I, you know, I had to learn it all later because I hadn't understood, you know, I hadn't just kind of watched her pour the spaghetti into the pot or, you know, be able to observe those things. So that's just a little example um, of, you know, how concept development is a little bit different for someone with, with a vision impairment. Um, okay, so um, what can concept development teach students with vision impairments? Um, students can learn about what objects are like, they can learn about what their environments are like, um, they can learn about even just how different, how objects or environments are different from each other. So like the two different kinds of restaurants that I explained. Um, and they can also learn about, you know, functions and activities. So um, a person with a vision impairment might touch an object and, and really have no idea what it's for. Um, and so concept development and intentional teaching around that can help the student understand this is how this is used or um, this is what you do when you go to a place like this. Um, this is what people are doing around you. Um, and that can be extremely helpful um, for a student. So, um, okay. Um, okay, sorry, my computer just did a funky little thing. All right. Um, so, Concept development for transition skills. I want to focus on a few different things here. Um, the first is concept development for independent living skills. Um, and then we're also going to talk about work skills and college readiness. Um, so um, the first is independent living skills. Um, and I broke it down into several different categories. Um, but um, so the first one that I, I um, it was hard because concept development is a really big, big, broad subject. Um, and so please feel free to ask any questions here or to um, add anything that you think that I've missed because this is not an exhaustive list by any means. Um, 
one of the things I want to talk about is, is um, concepts around groceries and food. Um, so it's really interesting to me when I've worked with students um, how little many students have um, a concept of things like food. Um, so many students I've worked with have kind of just been fed by their families um, and don't necessarily have much participation in, in preparing that food. Um, I have one student that had her, her favorite food was mashed potatoes, um, but she had never actually seen a potato before. She had never touched a potato, so she didn't know that potatoes are actually not soft and squishy and in a big pile, but that they're in fact, you know, a quite a hard vegetable that you get from the ground. Um, um, another student of mine never understood that spaghetti came from a box. So again, spaghetti was always served in a bowl with sauce and meatballs on top, um, rather than, you know, um, in, you know, them seeing it in a box in the grocery store, um, you know, these hard um, pieces of spaghetti. So um, I think it's really important that we teach students what food is like before it's prepared, um, or else the student's not going to understand how to prepare it. They're not going to even understand that it takes preparation necessarily. Um, and part of that is teaching about grocery stores, right? So um, if a student has a vision impairment, especially if they have no vision at all, um, maybe they don't go to the grocery store, but if they do, if they go with their families, um, they could easily go through and have no idea what their parents are getting. Um, I always was a kid that would kind of like, I was kind of nosy and I just like wanted to feel around and touch everything in the car all the time. <laughs> um, but, you know, and so I, I learned that way about, you know, the fruits and vegetables that my, my mom would buy, but I never understood, I never knew anything about the fruits and vegetables that my parents wouldn't buy. So a student might, you know, if the family is kind of accustomed to buying apples and bananas and oranges, they might have no idea that there are peaches next to the apples. Um, they might have no idea that there's, um, you know, that there's broccoli there. Um, and that's, that's a big deal, especially if students, you know, are trying to, you know, they're accustomed to eating a certain way and they want to eat a different way and they don't know what their options are. Um, they don't even maybe know that there's a fish counter at the grocery store um, because they've never eaten fish with their family or they've never bought fish at the grocery store. Um, so, um, I think that that's, that's a really big deal. We, it's really important that students know what's available to them and what's out there. So um, what I often suggest to parents is like, take your kids to the grocery store and talk about everything you're doing. Talk about, you know, I'm gonna buy some cereal now. And actually there's a lot of options for cereal, even though like when I go to the store with my kids, I only buy them one kind of cereal because all the other kinds are so full of sugar. <laughs> but um, but they, they're sighted children and they understand that there's all these other options available to them. And that's good. I'm glad that they know that. Um, even if it makes my life a little more difficult when they ask me for things I don't want to give them. Um, but um, I think that um, what I often say is, you know, take the kid to the store, explain that there's a deli counter, explain where the bakery is you know, so that you understand what's in the grocery store and you also understand the setup, right? So um, where is the milk usually kept in the store? Um, because if we're looking for our students to grow up into independent adults, there's gonna be a time where they're going to the grocery store themselves. Um, and ideally, I mean, even as teenagers, they could technically do that. Um, so um, if you know where to find the milk, that's helpful, right? So you might still have someone assisting you in your grocery shopping, but it's helpful to know where things are. Um, it's helpful also to know how things are packaged, right? Like sauce comes in a jar maybe, or unless it's homemade, of course, but you know, um, or like pasta comes in a box or, you know, these beans come in a can. Um, how do I even open a can? You know, some students haven't experienced any of that. 
Um, um, and the other thing is, um, I could go on and on about food because I like food, <laughs> but um, but is is the kitchen component of it, right? So beyond the grocery store, there's how do you actually prepare the food? So um, a lot of students haven't had a lot of experience with kitchen appliances, right? And that's everything from you know the toaster to um, just like you know knowing what the knives look like and as dangerous as that might sound to parents who don't want their students you know their their children who can't see touching a sharp knife um, it's actually really important for a student to understand you know that's what this is for and this is how it's used properly um, so i really encourage teachers or parents um, to to let the child spend some time in the kitchen and and learning about what's there um i mean we many of us i'm sure have those drawers in our kitchen where we have all of our like little appliances right like we have our garlic press or our can opener and just all of those things thrown in a big drawer um unless you're more organized than me <laughs> but um that's where you know those are really cool things for a person without vision to explore um because if you touch for example like um if you touch a can opener and you've never opened a can before, you're gonna have no idea what that's actually for. Um, so it's really, you know, it's a fun and exciting experience to, to learn about those things. Um, as simple and mundane as they may seem to someone who, who's, you know, who's seen them every day. Um, and also involved in that is kind of just learning about um, how to take care of food, right? So how to store it. Um, I, I knew, um, an individual um, who, and, and she had some, some cognitive um, impairments as well, um, but she went grocery shopping on her own one time and, and came back and um, she's an adult, um, but she had never learned where food would, should be stored. Um, so when I went into her kitchen, um, her, all of her things that should be refrigerated, like all of her dairy, and her vegetables and things were all just shoved into her cabinets. And her freezer was, she was using her freezer, but not for freezing. She just really put, put everything that she could put in the freezer. She was just kind of using it as a storage space. Um, so a lot of her food had gone bad and she just didn't know that, you know, cheese belongs in the refrigerator um, or that, you know, um, like cans of corn don't belong in the refrigerator, you know? so. Um, and that's, that's actually, it's not just important for, you know, helping them to helping people to become independent, but it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's a sanitation and health issue. So that's a really important one. Um, okay. I've spent a lot of time on food. Um, so let's move on to the, to the next one. Um, let's see here. Okay. So cleaning and home maintenance. Um, one of the things that I, 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 I knew a group of teachers um, of TVIs here in Maine um, who worked with some orientation and mobility instructors to plan some field trips for kids. Um, and one of the things that I thought was really awesome that they did was they took them to uh, like a home, like a Home Depot, like a home goods store, and they let the kids spend some time just feeling around the aisles and learning about the different tools and the different um, things that were there. So the kids got to feel all of the different toilets that the store was selling and all of the different light bulbs that the store was selling. Um, and someone spent time just showing them how to screw in a light bulb, which again, something that sounds so simple. I mean, we make jokes about how many people it takes to screw in a light bulb, but for someone with a vision impairment, First of all, they might not even think they need to learn it because if, if you, you have no vision whatsoever, why do I need to learn about a light bulb? But it's important. Um, it's important, you know, to maintain the house where you can have other people come in your home and see where they're going, right? So, and it's something that they may never have learned if someone didn't intentionally teach that. Um, and and that's even, even as simple as like feeling, um, like a toilet plunger and understanding how to use it. Um, so um, <clears throat> the other thing is, you know, is cleaning. So 
learning about cleaning supplies. And there's, there's ways that you know, students can identify what's what um, and kind of understanding like how to identify things by, by feel of the bottle or by odor or that you can't just smell every cleaning supply because it's not safe. Um, those are really important skills. Um, and also just knowing when something is, is dirty. Um, so um, like I walked into my house this afternoon with my children after work today and noticed that my counter was, you know, I could feel on my counter that there were crumbs and I was like, okay, I need to clean my counter. But that's not always as simple. And, and you know, sometimes there's, there's things that we can't necessarily feel. So how do you ensure that something is clean? Um, and again, all of these things will eventually lead to learning skills, but learning the concepts behind them and learning kind of just knowing, okay, I know this is dirty, will help someone learn, okay, I know this is clean. I know that I did a good job cleaning this, um, cleaning this counter. Um, and that goes to, to things like washing clothes as well, right? Like, how do you know when you have a stain on your shirt? Um, and sometimes you just don't, right? Like, I think sometimes any of us, even those of us with full vision, don't realize we have a stain on our shirt. Um, my husband does it all the time. Um, so, but, um, you know, learning about those things and, and how, to, how to even understand what to do about that, um, those are all important things. And, and stuff like that, like stain care and clothing care, is not just important for independent living, but it's also important for, for work readiness. Um, so you can't, I mean, you can't show up to, a, you know, an interview with like stained clothes and, you know, wrinkled pants, um, much as many of us might hate ironing, <laughs> you know, so you need to learn, like students need to understand what feel, you know, what kind of clothing is clean and what's appropriate and what should your clothes smell like? How do you know they're clean? Can they, do they smell good? Do they, do they feel um, smooth? You know, stuff like that. Um, how am I doing on time here? Let's see. Um, okay. 403 um, card. Thank you. Um, okay. So the other thing that I want to kind of talk about with independent living is stuff that we don't, it, this is stuff that I think really gets forgotten is um, housing and, and financial stuff. So, um, and this is, this is stuff that any, any, teenager, you know, going into adulthood needs to learn, um, but I think it's especially pertinent for students with vision impairments who just don't pick up on these things naturally. Um, so that's anything from like different kinds of housing available. So um, I recently bought a house with my husband um, several months ago when we moved to Maine. And when we were looking at houses, you know, we were talking about this is a colonial and this is a cape. And it's, I had to like spend some time getting some pretty thorough descriptions from people of, of what that means because I just I had no concept of it I did not understand it um, but even more basic than that um, like what is a house versus an apartment versus a condo uh, you know versus you know um, I don't know um, but the you know those are important things and I think the other thing is utilities. This is a huge one. I've met a lot of students that have no idea how their house gets warm. Um, they just kind of assume that it's naturally gets warm or cold. Um, and I've, I've thought about this a lot. Like, why does that happen? You know, it's, how is that different for a student with a vision impairment than not? Um, and I think, you know, part of it is like, they're not looking at the pipes. They're not seeing the oil truck come to deliver their oil for heat. Um, maybe it's things like that, um, but um, they're not seeing their parents write a bill, you know, write a check to the, to the water district, you know, um, all of those things, I think, play into it. So students really need to start understanding, you know, they don't need to understand every little thing about how their, their heating system works in their home, but it's important to understand that, you know, you don't just walk into a, um, you don't just move into an apartment and it automatically gets warm for you. Um, you have to buy your oil or your gas or however you heat your home. Um, and, you know, the same with electricity. Um, what do you do when the power goes out? And this is kind of a hard one because if you don't see, let's say you're completely blind, you're not gonna notice if the lights are out, but there are other things that will happen 
when you have no electricity. Um, so learning what to do and how to know when you've lost power is important and how to, how to have precautions for that too. Um, um, I used to love when the power went out when I was a kid because I thought it was fun that everyone else had to like use candles and I could just kind of walk around <laughs> and totally know what I was doing. But as an adult, uh, I do not like losing power because now I have, you know, kids and, uh, um, you know, kids in diapers and, and things like that, that, you know, electricity is extremely helpful and important for me. So, um, uh, and, and financial concepts are, are a big one as well. So again, this is something that, you know, a lot of parents of teenagers might say, my kid doesn't know how to do this either. And that's, that's okay. Um, I'm not necessarily advocating that every student with a vision impairment know this at age 12 or anything like that. But, but if there's a chance that that student's going to want to live on their own at some point, um, it's important to kind of have a basic understanding of, you know, what's a mortgage? What's rent? Oh, you have to pay rent to live in a house. You know, if you don't, you lose your house. Um, and again, that comes from not necessarily seeing someone writing a, a rent check every month. Um, or, you know, um, just not necessarily having to think about that stuff as a kid. Um, um, okay, so if anyone, um, if there, does anyone have questions so far? I can move on to employment if not, but if anyone has questions, please let me know. Okay. Well, feel free to interrupt me if you do. Courtney, um, folks, folks will either uh, just uh, unmute and start talking, or they'll uh, they'll uh, type in a question in the uh, oh, okay. in the chat. If, if stuff comes up in the chat, I will let you know. Absolutely great. Thank you. Okay. So the next section is concept development for employment skills. Um, one of the really big ones that we need to think about is professionalism, right? So, um, and this is a pretty complex one. Uh, it involves professional dress um, and just professional behavior. Um, one of the big ones I think about a lot with this one is a student I used to work with um, who had um, cerebral palsy and, um, and a vision impairment um, she had CVI, um, and she she would talk to me a lot about what professional dress was. She was doing a work placement at the time um, while I was working with her, and and she she would she was able to verbalize um, professional dress and you know how to she would say, well, I have to make sure my clothes look nice. But when it came down to it, she really didn't quite have a concept of what clothes looking nice meant. Um, and the way I, I kind of finally learned that um, was that, you know, um, her job coach told me she went to work with, um, you know, she was clean, but that she had pink sparkly shoes on and like a Hello Kitty backpack and, um, you know, um, and in a place that is supposed to be very professional and very, um, you know, where you don't wear a Hello Kitty backpack, you know, a pretty serious office setting. Um, and for that student, she was pretty upset about the fact that she couldn't take her, you know, her Hello Kitty purse with her or her backpack with her um, to work. And so we really had to have a conversation about, you know, um, about what professional means and what accessories, you know, what accessories are considered professional and not. Um, and that, like, I wasn't trying to squash her individuality. <laughs> um, but there's certain times where that's okay and certain times where that you know it's not really okay or where it doesn't give off the right impression um the other thing is um just what is professional clothing so um some students and i've noticed this especially with students who are totally blind um there's there might be kind of an understanding of like I wear, um, you know, I, I understand the difference between sneakers and dress shoes, um, but beyond that, it's hard. And so 
especially for women, um, where there's about eight, eight million different kinds of shoes to wear, it's really hard for a student to understand what a dress shoe is that she can wear to work. Um, and so um, I've oftentimes um, done this with my students or I've had other teachers or parents do it with, with, their, with their children. Um, it's just brought a bunch of different kinds of shoes in for students to feel. Um, so, you know, kind of understanding, okay, this is a sneaker. Where do you wear a sneaker? You can wear it when you're hanging out with your friends. You can wear it if you're going on a walk or going for a run. Um, now there's this kind of shoe and you can wear this to work. It's a low heel or it's a flat. And this kind of shoe is, you know, this really high heeled boot. And this might be something you would only wear when you go out, um, like out dancing or out, I don't know, I'm really not a fashion person and I don't wear fancy shoes, but, <laughs> but that's an important one um, because, you know, using high heels as an example, right? Not all, all high heels are created equal. There's some you might wear to work and there's some you definitely wouldn't wear to work. Um, and, and that's the case with a lot of different kinds of clothing, right? And, and um, I'm working with a student right now who just started an internship at the YMCA, which was a tricky place because he's doing work, you know, kind of in a fitness center. Um, so it was trying to figure out, you know, do I wear a, sh a polo shirt? Do I wear workout clothes? Do I wear a dress shirt? And I had to kind of bring in all different kinds of clothes for him to feel and to learn about. Um, this is what this, you know, this kind of shirt is, and this is what this kind of shirt is, and this is the setting you might use this, you know, these kinds of clothing in. Um, um, and professionalism on a, you know, more behavioral level. Um, one of the things that I think is a big one that I notice with students a lot is posture. Um, I have gotten lectured about my posture by my mother for, for <laughs> 20 years, probably. Um, and, you know, I think it's a lot better now, but I didn't understand for a long time, you know, why is posture important? And what does it even mean to have good posture? Um, that's something that's really hard to, to understand if you're not, not seeing others do it and you're not being able to kind of model that behavior. Um, so being able to conceptualize those things is, is challenging without someone really intentionally teaching you how to do it. Um, hygiene is another one. Um, again, I think some people can understand what good hygiene is but there are certain things that they might wear, you know, like certain ways that they might um, present themselves like at home that they might not do at work. And kind of understanding those boundaries is hard for someone who, who can't see the way others are carrying themselves and presenting themselves around them. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so the next one is job application and work concepts. Um, so if you have a vision impairment, um, you may have no idea what a job application even looks like. Now, a lot of applications are online. So nowadays, like it says, well, there's still a lot of like paper applications that you fill out. Um, and if you can't see them, you really don't know what they even involve, right? Um, so that's, that's a big one. Um, and also a resume format. So if you've never seen a resume and you can't just kind of pull one up on the computer and, and glance at it, it's really hard to understand what that even looks like. So um, even for me, and I've written so many resumes over the course of my you know, adult life, um, I still don't really have a great concept of the visual format of a resume um, because I can't see it. And so every single time that I write a resume, I still send it to someone who has full vision just to look at it and help me like make the lines look pretty <laughs> because otherwise for me, it would just be a big block of text um, or, you know, just lines of, of text that don't necessarily look nice. Um, <clears throat> so um, let's see. Um, the other thing I think about is, is concepts, you know, at the workplace. Um, so these are things like, okay, what's a time clock? Um, how do you use it? What is it for? Um, and how would you recognize one by, by touch if you can't see it? 
um, things like that, someone may never have experienced before, especially someone who has never been employed. Um, that might be a totally new idea. Um, and a badge and all of those kind of little things you get on the first day of work that you learn about, right? Like an employee handbook and um, this is your access key to get into this building. Um, all of those things are new, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and, you know, and new concepts for someone who can't, who can't see. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, got a little <clears throat> tickle. Um, okay. Um, the other thing that's, that's really big, I think, for, for students with vision impairments is the concept of, of work culture. Um, I think this is, and the reason it's difficult is because this is something that, that's, that's hard to explain verbally. Um, we pick up on things, on visual cues in our workplace that we don't even realize we're picking up on, right? So any job that you've had in the past, you can think back and you can kind of get a general sense of what that culture was like at that job, right? Like, you know, oh, that job that I had when I was a teenager, you know, when I was working at that burger place, that was a really fun job. It was just, it was fun. Everyone kind of, you know, we worked, but we, we played and we chatted and it was really laid back. Um, but that job I worked at, you know, in my 20s where I was, um, you know, uh, like sitting at a computer screen all day and, and getting yelled at all the time by my, my boss. It was, it was horrible and it wasn't, it was not a relaxed atmosphere. We were never allowed to, no one ate lunch with each other. We sat at our desks and like, you know, that was, you know, that's a totally different kind of culture, right? So those are just examples, but um, we pick up a lot of information about the culture of our workplace by visual observation and, and other ways, but visual observation is a big one. So um, whenever I start a new job, I always kind of ask my coworkers, um, what's the dress code here? Um, and what is, oh, how do people eat lunch here? Do we eat at our desks or should I, you know, should I go sit somewhere else? Where should I go? What do people do? Do we eat out? Do people bring their food? Um, what do people do during break time? Is there break time or do we just say there is and we actually do work the whole time? Um, you know, and, and all of that is culture. Um, and if you can't see it, you don't necessarily pick up on it immediately. Um, and culture is kind of a small thing in some ways, right? You know, you do the job and you get the job done and you don't necessarily have to understand the culture completely. But for a student with a vision impairment, Social skills are often really um, something that they that that a lot of students with vision impairments really need to work on, and th so those social interactions and that kind of cultural understanding is really really important and really big for for students to kind of build on those skills. Um, so I think sometimes those are more important than than we might think. Um, okay. Um, so now the next thing is worksite specific concepts. So um, I just gave a few examples here, um, but honestly, it's it's a lot bigger than I than I put on this slide. But um, every worksite that you go to is going to have things that you do that you might not do at another worksite, right? And so in this slide here, I pulled up just some examples of um, typical entry level job sites. Um, so I thought about the kitchen as a job site, right? So like people who might go and work as a dishwasher, for example, as their first job. Um, so I'm really thinking about, you know, teenage students that we might be working with who, who are doing their very first job. Um, so in a kitchen, right? If you're, working, if you're working in a kitchen setting, you've maybe probably never seen an industrial dishwasher before. Um, I know the first time I saw one, I had no clue how it worked or, or what to do with it. I was like, this is nothing like my dishwasher at home. Um, and I really had to ask someone to teach me how to use it. Um, um, and there's other, you know, probably more industrial appliances in the kitchen that, that are, are quite different in their setup. Um, so for a student with a vision impairment, that's gonna take some teaching. Um, the other thing is, you know, sanitation, right? Like how do, how do people who work in a kitchen keep their, keep their um, 
keep their kitchens clean, things like that. Um, and I just want to throw in here too, as I'm as I'm saying this, I'm remembering something I I, I missed earlier that I think is really important. Um, that as students are developing concepts, one of the things that we can kind of start to under to do um, is understand generalized concepts that we you know or concepts that we can generalize to larger situations. And I'm thinking about it with the kitchen because a kitchen is something that typically has all of the same things in it, no matter what kitchen you go to. Some kitchens will have more things than others, right? Some kitchens will have fancy things and some will have dishwashers and some won't. But we kind of all understand that a kitchen has some kind of cooking, like a stove or an oven and a refrigerator. Um, um, I always think about the, um, the biggest one for me is always the um, a bathroom because our like our bathrooms that we use at home are so different from a public restroom and public restrooms are really hard for someone with a vision impairment because they are different no matter where you go and you have to search around <laughs> for everything. Um, but when we can help a student develop a concept that they can generalize, um, then that's at least helpful. So um, if I went into a bathroom at you know um, a restaurant and I you know didn't really understand the general concept of the bathroom I would have trouble finding even knowing what to look for right but at least when I go in even though it might be confusing and stressful because I'm having to search around to find the toilet and to find the sink and to know where the soap is and how high up the soap dispenser is on the wall at least I know that I need to find a soap dispenser and I need to find either some paper towels or something that's going to blow on my hands to dry them off right so um, I know I just diverged a little bit from, from the slides here, but I wanted to throw that out there because I think as we, as we can help our students with general concepts, that really helps them to, to be able to apply them in, in multiple situations. Um, so other worksite specific things, you know, an office has like a copy machine and a fax machine, things that we don't usually spend time learning about unless we're in an office. Um, and um, the same goes for stores, like how does, how does merchandise arrive? Like how, does, how do clothes get put on the shelves and are they organized in a certain way? Um, so those are all things students need to learn as they, um, you know, as they get their first job. And I just realized I'm getting pretty short on time. So I'm gonna speed through the college one here. Um, okay, so for college um, readiness, we have um, concepts for academic life. So with this, I'm thinking about college classroom setup. Um, you know, a school classroom in an elementary school or a high school is going to be a pretty standard. But when you get into college, you've got seminar rooms and you've got lecture halls. Um, and they're all quite different from one another. Um, and, and the other thing is like a course syllabus, right? So that's also quite different, right? We don't, we don't, that's not necessarily how things are done in, in high school. Maybe it is in some classrooms, but it can be quite different. Um, and understanding, you know, what a typical reading assignment is like in college. Um, I, for one, was pretty overwhelmed by the amount of reading I had to do when I went to college um, compared to high school. So um, now for residential, oh, uh, yep, for residential life. This is a big one, I think, dorm rooms, for example. So if a kid's never gone away to camp before, um, they probably have no idea what a dorm looks like. So what's in a dorm room? And, and how can you store things in your dorm room? Um, when I went to college, my mom took me to Target and let me just feel around all of the different storage options that they sold for college kids. It was really fun. And it was just kind of a cool way for me to learn about what was out there, what my options were. Um, and how my, you know, my classmates and, and roommates and stuff might be doing, doing their own dorm room decoration. Um, public restrooms is a big one because um, kids are used to having their own bathrooms with, that they share only with their family members and aren't really understanding like what a public shower means and how you deal with that. Uh, and, you know, that you need to wear sandals um, when you go to take a shower, things like that. Um, intentional teaching around that's important um, and then the last one is campus life um, in this I'm thinking about things like um, 
extracurriculars, right? So how do you learn about what events are on campus? Um, how do you, if you can't see those posters that are hanging up saying that there's a concert on Friday night, how are you going to learn about that? Um, and how do people find out that information? Um, the biggest one for me is dining halls. I stress this to my students over and over and over again. I had a horrible experience in college with dining halls because I was so shy and so um, such a poor self-advocate in college that I just was terrified of dining halls because they're very confusing if you can't see them and they're loud and echoey. And so, and I didn't take the time before college to learn about how they were set up and where the different food you know, options were and who was available in a dining hall to, to provide assistance. Um, and so I often just would skip meals because I was so uncomfortable. Um, so I make sure that my students don't do that because <laughs> it was not fun. Um, that's, I think, one of the biggest ones. It can be one of the biggest accessibility challenges for kids. Um, and the last one is safety. It's really important. And I'm not just thinking about safety like walking across campus late at night, but also um, going to parties, right? So much as we don't like to think about it, our kids will go to parties someday when they get to college. And how do you keep safe in a situation where you can't see where you're going and you also probably can't hear that well because it's loud and there's dancing and music and um, maybe not everyone around you is in the best state of mind to help you out. So understanding what those situations will be like before you actually enter into those kinds of situations and having a concept of that can be extremely helpful. Um, so um, I didn't put a slide about this, but you know, I think my recommendations are really just to, to do as much exposure as possible and as much intentional explanation and teaching as possible. And that's not just for teachers, but for parents as well. So really encourage your parents, the parents of your students to, to, to do a lot of that teaching. And it can just be, you know, taking them to the, taking your child to um, a post office or taking your child to um, two different places with you so that you can explain to them what's going on in the world around them. I think that's extremely important. So um, a lot of information, but do you have any questions before we finish? Well, that was really good timing, uh, Courtney. We're, uh, we're just about right on our end time and uh, I'm wondering as well if anyone has any questions or comments.